As you know, I run a course in St. Louis, Missouri, and what is important to me is teaching the beginners. And I would like to say, if you are a beginner, is to begin to begin away from the crown. Don't do the crown because the crown is particularly difficult for so many reasons beyond just in its design, but also in its planning. So we'll talk about some of the limitations so that you know what I'm talking about as we proceed here. How do you explain to someone what they can't see, the back of the head? Well, you have to present all sides of the picture. What does that mean? What it means is that it's not just the baldness that you can see from the back, but it does affect the profile view in the middle there, the roundness, because there's a flattening effect when there is crown loss. And also, it does affect the visual density in the front. So if you restore the crown, you can achieve better visual density from all angles. But who is a candidate per se? For me, I've tried to set up some guidelines on who is safe and who is not. First of all, I like to say someone over 35 years of age. And that is so important because if someone is just starting out, if they're starting to operate on someone 20 years of age and that crown begins to expand, it could be very problematic because there will be not enough grafts to cover it and then an unnatural result over time. Especially if that front side has not been done already, um, you could lose so much on the front and then use all the grafts in the back and that can also look unnatural if the front is gone and then the crown is densely transplanted. So this is one of the reasons why this is an advanced topic because you may run out of grafts. You, besides just designing something natural, you may not have enough to do it. And also what's important is working with someone to really understand trying to stabilize further uh, loss. So this is important because the crown can continue to expand and medical therapy can be an important adjunct to minimize the number of surgeries in the future even though we cannot uh, hang our hat on just medical therapy. But medical therapy to me is an important component to getting the best results in the crown and to minimize uh, too many sessions in the backside. It is also something that requires some sophistication on the part of the doctor to take a look at the donor capacity and say, okay, not only do I have enough to cover the baldness that I'm seeing today, especially when the hair is wet, wetted down where there's a, a fringe of further loss around it, but also we have enough to manage the further progression of this baldness as, so that it won't look like just a weird circular area transplant with a halo of baldness that progresses. So it is also important that the patient understands the need for more procedures. The crown hair patterns come in all different sizes. This is done by zeroing, and you can see that the different percentages that are done on the are shown at the bottom, mainly are S's, uh, S shape uh, for men, and for women, there is a higher percentage of just general diffusion where there isn't an articulated uh, circular fashion that you can see. The crown hair loss patterns are important as well. The, the circular one is obvious. The kidney shape one is a variant. But the coronet pattern is one that I always look for. I look for the miniaturization that is occurring below this area because below the crown, because this is an area that may compromise what can be harvested and may require more grafts to transplant into that smaller circle below. This is something that Michael Beener has talked about, which is the billboard effect. I like to use this terminology with patients. What it describes is the fact that when you look at the hairline, the hairline is on a angle, so you don't see the scalp directly. But the definition of baldness or balding is seeing bald scalp. So when you're looking at the crown, the crown is on the posterior vertical scalp. So when you look at it, you can see a lot of scalp. So that is one reason why it's so hard to achieve dense visual effect on in the back of the scalp. And that's why in, during this lecture, I'm going to try to talk to you about some things, some creative methodologies that I've created to help create better visual density with limited number of graphs or fewer graphs or even just the graphs that you have at hand. The second thing is that these graphs um, that, that you're placing are in a whirl pattern. They're in a circular pattern, and these graphs are splaying open. So that, by definition, is harder to achieve visual density than when they're all lined up and interlocked going in the same direction like in the hairline. So how do you plan the donor area? Remember that you always have to look for a possible coronet pattern that's down there. Now, of course, there's two ways to harvest 
graphs. You can do FUE or FUT. I do both of them quite a bit. In general, when I'm dealing with a very large crown, even though it is romantic to say FUE can cover everything, I am not a big fan of FUE to try to harvest uh, graphs to cover the crown because, in my opinion, you burn out the whole donor donor hair unless the donor hair is great is very dense and the crown is not very large. But when you have a very large crown and you've got a, a recession that's going there, especially with the coronet, you just burn out all the donor hair when you're doing FUE, and that's a dirty secret that I, I would say. So. If we're planning it, you got to plan the donor harvest below the coronet pattern. An initial plan that you draw may be all well and good until you start to wet the hair and realize that you actually have a further fringe of miniaturization around that hair that needs to be accommodated for. So in the older patient, you may be able to be more conservative, but conversely, which may not make initial sense, the younger patient, you have to be slightly more aggressive going out because you have to accommodate further loss. With female crowns, I call this the dumbbell design, which is not necessarily um, truth for every female. But what I find is in most women, except for some women where they have extensive crown loss, they have this little area where they just don't have enough lift in the hair. They lose this ability to create the lift, the lift of their hair. And so it looks like a general larger central forelock followed by the area of the part, and that's a whole different lecture, and then a smaller crown area. And that lifting effect, that roundness of the crown we talked about early on, and I'm going to talk to you about that as we continue with this lecture in a few minutes. So uh, just uh, it, it, like in my lecture on recipient sites, you have to understand the subregions well. These subregions define how we talk about the design. So the, we have the central center of the whirl, the upper and lower arc, and then the vertex transition point or vertex transition zone, which is transitioning over to the horizontal posterior mid scalp. So let's take a look at this with another schematic. If you have this, the, the surrounding hairs on the periphery and you'd create the central whirl pattern, I always start with the central whirl pattern because it's much easier to design from the central whirl going out than going back in toward the central whirl. When I go from outside in, I typically find that the whirl does not look right. So I start with the whirl and go outwards. And when you make that design, you notice that with these pink lines, uh, that they there's a gradual transition. And, and you can see that this blue dotted line shows you that going from one angle to the other, there's not an abrupt angle change. And I've emphasized this in my lecture on recipient sites, that all angles should be slightly, just gently changing into another an, uh, another uh, angle without an abrupt transition to make it look natural. So what is my preferred design? The preferred design is for a right, for a person that parts his hair on the, uh, on the left going to the right, most right-handed people do that. I would like to start with a, uh, a clockwise whirl starting very high up. Now why is that? Several reasons. Number one is that the hairs go up into the hair part and, and really block that hair part to a certain extent. Of course you have to give enough hair in the hair part in terms of, of uh, if, you're, if you're putting transplants there. But it creates a, a, a less see-through to the hair part. It follows the combing direction which is easier to comb and creates better visual density. And putting the, uh, the whirl way up high allows the, the arc of the hair to, to go down over the crown vertically, because remember this is on a vertical scalp. So when you start the whirl high, it's able to go down over the, over the crown and create better visual coverage than starting low and going upwards. And so this is obviously a design that can only be done in someone completely bald in the back that doesn't have trace hairs that you have to follow. This is like a, a blank slate, a person that's completely bald in the crown. You can design any way you like, and this is how I do it. And so further finesse uh, points is where are the priority zones? Remember that in my recipient site lecture, I talk about visual density created by different gradients of visual dense, uh, sorry, of, of, de of density patterns. And so the one, two, three, four tells you where I put the greatest density of hairs. So one is the number one for the reason that it's arcing over. Two is because it's arcing down. Three because it's covering the part going up and four because it's not doing very much. So I will actually make different uh, density priorities based on that. Now what if you did the opposite, which is again not my preferred design, it, uh, but sometimes you've got a person that already has a, a 
a remnant of a world going this direction, then you got to follow it. So if you're going to do this going this direction, the pr this are just showing you how to put where the greatest priorities. The one and two are the highest because if you look at that, that goes over and covers the bald crown, whereas three and four are really going into the fringe uh, of the hair and not really contributing a lot toward visual density. And this is showing you a low left whirl going clockwise, and this is the opposite. Now, the, now because the, the whirl is low, and again, I would only design this if the person already has a whirl in this area, and I'm just trying to reinforce what he has, I would put greater visual density or greater, excuse me, greater density gradient of recipient sites in the one to two zone and fewer in the three to four because that one to two arcs over the over the crown. So now you can sort of see that what I'm going through, and this is the final one, which is a low left world counterclockwise, same thing. You can see one and two being uh, coverage for that crown in the back side, whereas three and four are don't necessarily need as much density, but you don't want to create an area where it's high, high density and then just very scattered density because it won't look right. So everything has got to be a gradual transition in terms of visual density. Graph sizes, they're not oftentimes a lot of forehair graphs. I'm just putting that there. These are not priority things in terms of showing one, two, three, four priority, but these are graph sizes, like two hair graphs, three hair graphs, four hair graphs. You can see that um, I, if there are three hair graphs, I, I allocate them toward the area where I can create better visual densities, like larger paint brushes in here. In the past, I would be using for my recipient sites mainly 18 and 19 gauges to create the sites. The 20 gauge are really for one hair is for the hairline. I really don't use 20 gauge in the back, but I have found that sometimes it can create a little bit of a cyst somewhere at a few weeks to a month out. So I've really changed over now to use 19 and 18 gauge solid core needles uh, to make my design. And, and that has virtually eliminated the issue. Um, counterclockwise, right side of world, this is a just showing you the crown uh, design. You can see there's no abrupt transition zones. This is a clockwise left side of world, just showing you again, if you look carefully, there are no abrupt transition zones and there's higher visual density in the areas of critical uh, importance. Uh, over here, what you're seeing is what I mentioned uh, in my recipient site lecture that the angles go progressively higher and higher and higher. Now, why would you want these very high angles in the crown? Well, there's actually three reasons. Number one, remember what I said about the rounded profile. The crown, when you lose the crown from the profile view, you lose the, 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 the arch of the, um, of the crown. And so by placing them at a higher angle, you create a lifted effect where the crown looks denser that way. And that's the second point, greater visual density. Now, why greater visual density? Because the hairs go up and then down, which is exactly the opposite thing for the hairline where you want the angles to go low because they are angled low to create a shingling effect. Whereas these, because they're in a whirl effect, you can actually create a tighter placement when you place them higher up. There's less competition below the skin for these sites. Can you imagine in a big whirl, if you make them very low angled, that there's so much spacing underneath the skin that's being wasted with these sites that you can't densely pack them. So for these three reasons, I make my site angles very high. This is just showing a model of a, of a crown angle to show the, the higher density. This is uh, just a, a design. Again, this is just the reason I'm showing these designs is just to show you the, the creativity that's involved with uh, making recipient sites. Uh, this is just showing you after the graphs have been placed. And this is just showing another uh, design and then the, the accompanying design uh, uh, from the recipient side creation. The hairline is better to be positioned, excuse me, when designing hairline recipient sites, it's better to place the patient supine and make those site angles low. But when you're doing the crown, it is better to have the patient sitting up because you can then more easily make those site angles high. Now, when you're trying to make the, the lower portion of the crown, uh, for example, the going in a clockwise pattern, it is easier to have the patient recumbent because those angles are low. As you remember in the, the diagram I showed before, and it's easier for the body, for the, the surgeon to make those sites. And then conversely, uh, counterclockwise, doing the lower crown, it's easier to have the patient lying the other direction to make those sites. And so, in general, um, oftentimes you can do, for example, a first session in the front, a second session in the crown, and then a total session over the whole area to create visual density in three sessions. 
Um, I oftentimes now, because I have enough staffing, I can do a mega session and try to cover the whole thing in one session, but I always undersell the crown. I always tell the patient that the crown may take two sessions just because the, the crown has the billboard effect issue and sometimes the growth is just slightly less in the front and with all those factors, I always try to undersell the crown. This is just showing you the, the, the clockwise fashion of of a crown. This is showing you the rounding effect, how powerful on the side view uh, crown uh, transplantation can be. This is a gentleman that has a slot deformity from previous uh, scalp reduction that I've done a transplant on, a single session transplant to cover that slot deformity. Uh, this is a gentleman that's been on finasteride with some er just a small uh, uh, area of loss, but just I'm able to create a, um, a good visual density for him. This is the diffusion pattern in a female that you see. You can use finer grafts, and for example, this Asian has fine hairs, but even those fine hairs provide nice coverage for him. And the other thing too is uh, in my recipient site lecture, I talk about uh, interlocking and making those, those sites very tight and going in one direction. Well, this gentleman's crown, fortunately, all goes in the upper arc and it's small. So you can easily create very high density uh, for this gentleman because there's no whirl. Oh, they all go in one direction going up. This is the upper portion of the arc that is there. Uh, this is a gentleman with uh, uh, plugs that were easily corrected um, with an FUE technique to help restore this. And what's great about plugs is that if you have enough ability to cover them, you don't actually have to take them out. You just use those plugs to create visual density, but you graft around it so that you can't see those plugs anymore. PRP and A-cell, are very powerful uh, techniques to help restore early signs of hair loss, uh, but my favorite is just to be on, for patients to be on some kind of uh, medical therapy. So I end this lecture with just understanding that it's not just the technical aspects of crown design, but it's also the creative thought process of making beautiful work so that people look awesome. And safety is so critical. So use both the left brain, which is the analytical brain, as well as the right brain, which is the creative brain. Thank you so much for your attention today.